this is the last part of my talk about how to display arenagram. In part one I gave an introduction and in part two I presented a quiz with some questions that hopefully demonstrated why correct display of the arenagram is important. In part three I talked about what a good display should include and showed how to achieve this. So now in part four I'm going to talk about absolute function, how to calculate percent uptake, how to allow for kidney depth and how to deal with late images. Now to calculate percent uptake we need to take the kidney counts per second as a fraction of the counts per second in the injected dose and multiply by 100 to get a percent. Now the kidney counts per second are what comes from the renogram after background subtraction so that's easy. The dose counts per second we could get by taking the dose syringe and imaging it on the gamma camera and indeed there are some analysis techniques that do that. However, that's not necessary because the dose counts per second is just the administered activity in megabacrels with a decay factor to allow for any decay between measurement and injection and multiplied by the sensitivity of the gamma camera in counts per second per megabacrel. Now we should know the administered activity because we measure each patient dose in an ISO calibrator before we inject it as a matter of routine so that doesn't require any additional work. The decay factor is calculated from the time between dose measurement and patient injection and that's easy because we know that time and we know the half time of the radionuclide which is usually technetium 99M. So all we need to know is the system sensitivity this can be measured once for each gamma camera and collimator that we use for inography so it's not a, a great deal of effort just to measure that and store that as a constant. To measure it we just need a phantom. Um, I like to use a saline bag which is roughly kidney sized um, and to inject into that a known activity of technetium 99M solution. About two megabecquerels is sufficient as long as we measure it in the ISTOP calibrator we'll know exactly how much activity we put in there. Put it at the bottom of a bowl of water with seven and a half centimeters of water from the center of the bag to the surface of the water to simulate a depth of the kidney in a patient's back. The water makes a good substitute for human tissue because it has about the same attenuating factor. You'll need to stick the saline bag down to the bowl to stop it floating around. But then if you put the bowl uh, of, with the saline bag underneath a gamma camera, with the gamma camera looking down at it, you can acquire a one minute image of this phantom. Uh, notice that although the depth of water matters because that attenuates the gamma rays, the air gap between the gamma camera and the bowl doesn't cause any additional attenuation and because the sensitivity of the camera with a parallel hole collimator doesn't change with distance, it doesn't matter how close we get the camera to the ball. We can get an image something like this. Uh, here we can see the saline bag in the middle and we draw a region of interest around that just as we would draw around a kidney. We draw a background region somewhere nearby. This is just a simple static image so it doesn't need any fancy background subtraction something like a simulated perirenal region around the bag will do. Actually there's no activity in the background water so the only background activity here would be scatter from the bag itself. Um, however in the real renogram we'll have a similar region near to the kidney and that will also be subtracting a small amount of scatter so we simulate the same sort of subtraction in this phantom. Then we can subtract the background counts from the bag counts to get the net counts in the bag. We know how long it was acquired for and we know how many megabacquerels so we can work out the sensitivity in counts per second per megabacquerel. And this is the sensitivity appropriate for a kidney sized object at 7.5 centimeters deep in water. So what we've got there is a standard calibration factor that would be appropriate if both kidneys were seven and a half centimeter deep in the patient. That is adequate for most adults but clearly it's not appropriate for children. Children are smaller, their kidneys don't lie so deep. 
but uh, many years ago Iske Gordon published a simple formula that enables you to estimate the depth of a child's kidney based on their weight. So if you put the weight into his formula it comes up with an estimated depth which will be less than seven and a half centimeters. So we increase the measured sensitivity by 12% for every centimeter less depth. That's because technetium 99m gamma rays at 140 kV lose 12% of intensity in every centimeter of tissue. So we're allowing for the less tissue in the, in the child this way. There are similar formulae for adults based on height and weight. So we can use those if you want to estimate kidney depth for an adult. However, they only deal with an average patient of that height and weight. They won't give you the accurate depth for any individual patient. If you want to get a patient-specific result, you need to measure their kidney depth. That can be done in several ways. The simplest is just to use ultrasound to measure the kidney depth. If you do that, the ultrasound must be made with the patient in the same position, either erect or supine, that's used for the renogram because mobile kidneys can flop around and the kidney depth can change just by the patient lying down. Uh, you can use a lateral view of the with the gamma camera at the end of the renogram. If you take a lateral view looking at the kidney side on, you can estimate the distance between the middle of the kidney and the patient's back. Um, alternatively, if there's an existing CT image, you may be able to measure the distance from the middle of the kidney to the patient's back on an existing CT image, providing the renogram was done with the patient in the same position as the CT. An alternative to allow for difference in kidney depth is to calculate the geometric mean of the anterior and posterior results. So for that you need two renograms and you can do that using a dual head gamma camera to acquire two renograms simultaneously with one head positioned behind the patient for a posterior view and another one positioned in front of the patient for an anterior view. So you get two renograms and analyze them both separately and calculate the results from that and then take the geometric mean in the same way as one would do for a DMSA renal scan. There is also a way of calculating a geometric mean set of images from the anterior and posterior renogram images and analyzing that. Now absolute renal function is measured in units of mil per min. It can either be glomerulfiltration rate, GFR, or effective renal plasma flow, ERPF. Those can be measured accurately using blood clearance. In nuclear medicine, we can use technetium 99M DTPA or chromium 51 EDTA to measure GFR, or I125 labeled hippuran for ERPF. But those techniques require multiple blood samples, or at the very least, a single blood sample. So to get an answer in mil per min you need blood samples. However some analysis programs quote a value for GFR from the renogram which doesn't include any blood samples. So how does it manage to get an answer in mils per min without a blood sample? Well all of these techniques are based on a regression equation that relates the percent of activity in the kidneys to a proper blood clearance determined on a group of patients. So they only give an approximate value. If you want a true individual kidney GFR, so you want to know the clearance in mils per minute for left and right kidney separately, you need to do two things. You need to measure the total GFR by blood clearance and then split it between the left and right kidneys using the relative function from the renogram. So you need two tests, the renogram and a GFR by blood clearance you can't get an accurate value from the renogram on its own. However, the Gates method is implemented on some nuclear medicine computers and so it is quite common to find a value of GFR quoted by this technique. So let me just say a little bit about it. Um, Gates method was based on using technetium 19M MDTPA. So if you're using technetium MAG3, it won't give the correct result because his regression equation 
was based on use of DTPA and the clearance of MAG3 is greater than DTPA. His technique images the dose syringe on the camera before injection rather than using the known sensitivity of the gamma camera as I suggested. His method employs background subtraction using small regions of interest under each kidney and as I explained in my talk on how to process a renogram that will tend to under subtract so it won't give the correct results with other background methods. If you use um, a perirenal background or you use the Rutland method then that will give a different amount of background subtraction and so Gates's regression equation won't be true any longer. He applied depth correction based on the patient's height and weight using Tonneson's formula which is only an average for typical patient so it won't give a precise answer for every individual patient. The technique expresses the total two minute uptake in left and right kidneys added together as a percentage of the counts from the dose syringe and then deduces the GFR from his regression equation which was derived from 51 patients who also had creatinine clearance. So if you follow his technique exactly you should get an estimate of absolute function but it is only an estimate so treat the results with caution. If you leave the renogram curves as counts per second, um, as I've explained, that gives no indication of the absolute function at all because it depends on how much activity you administer and the collimator use. So unless you always give the same activity and use the same collimator, it's pointless displaying renogram curves as counts per second. If you express the renogram curves as percent of administered activity, as I've suggested, that allows for different dose activity and different collimators and could even allow you to compare with renograms done in other centers if they do the same thing. So it certainly gives an indication of absolute function without implying the undue accuracy that the result in mils per minute might imply. In fact, if you quote the uptake in each kidney at a fixed time, such as two minutes or three minutes after the start of the renogram, that gives a figure that can be compared with st serial studies in the same patient and since the kidney depth will stay the same for one patient in one study after another um, if it's slightly an error because the kidney depth is wrong then that error will still be the same in subsequent renograms so this is a sensible figure to carry through from one study to another. However if you go so far as to convert to the actual clearance in mils per minute that seems to give a false impression of accuracy by quoting those units, uh, mainly because the kidney depth is not sufficiently well known and that's the biggest uncertainty in quoting a precise clearance in mils per minute. So my opinion is that it's best to just quote the uptake as percent of administered activity without going so far as to try to quote an actual clearance in mils per minute. This is particularly true if you're using MAG3 because the clearance of MAG3 is neither GFR nor ERPF. It's somewhere between the two. Finally, let me say something about late images. The guidelines all recommend that if the kidneys haven't emptied by the end of the renogram, then you should acquire additional late static images. Um, this is particularly true if the renogram was acquired with the patient supine because with the patient supine you don't have the benefit of gravity assisting kidney drainage which you would get if the renogram was acquired erect. So if the renogram was acquired supine and you stand the patient up at the end and then take another image you can see whether gravity helped the kidneys to drain. If it hasn't then maybe the full bladder was um, hindering drainage so you take another image after they've emptied their bladder and if it still hasn't emptied maybe bring them back again later on to see if the kidneys have emptied sometime later. So all these images should be displayed um, and they should all be displayed with the same maximum. Don't let the computer scale each image to its own maximum otherwise we'll have the same problem that we did with the summed images. So it, we need to be clear whether the activity has, in the kidney has drained despite changes in bladder activity. In fact you can calculate the percent of dose remaining in each kidney in order to compare with the end of the renogram and that can be very helpful. Here's an example of uh, late images. 
Here, this patient had an erect image acquired after the renogram. First of all, there's an image at 44 minutes after they've been to empty their bladder, uh, and then a later image at 70 minutes. And from those images, it looks as if after voiding at 44 minutes, the right kidney hadn't emptied, and it still hadn't emptied by 70 minutes because the image looks just as black. But actually, it's a display level problem again. The computer has scaled the 70 minutes image so that the highest counts are still black, and so the intensity of that kidney hasn't changed. If we display both images with the same maximum, it's now clear that the right kidney has emptied at 70 minutes. So these images are very important to make sure that they do display with the same maximum in all the images. In fact, we can do even better by drawing regions of interest around the kidneys, um, and we can see here, we can quantify the um, activity in each kidney as a percentage of the administered activity in the same way as we did for the renogram. And that allows easy comparison with the renogram curve. So for example, we can see here that at 44 minutes the right kidney had 6.2% of, of the administered activity, and at 70 minutes it had 2.3%. So if we look at the renogram display, we can add those as extra points on the renogram. Here, the renogram finished at 40 minutes, with the right kidney not having emptied. But if we add a point for the post-void image at 44 minutes, showing 6.2%, and at 70 minutes showing 2.3%, we can join those with dotted lines to say what the renogram would have been like had the patient carried on. So in that way, the right kidney shows progressive elimination after blood avoiding right up to the 70 minutes. So it's as if we had a very much longer renogram without the patient having to be there for all the time, and that can be a very useful way to display those late imaging results. So in summary, for what we've seen in this talk on display of the renogram, we've learnt that good renogram display is a good public relations exercise for a nuclear medicine department. The display of the renogram is an essential part of the renogram report. If the display is easy to understand, it will get used. So it should be easy to identify the curves for the reader. The vertical scale should be percent of uptake, not counts per second, because that gives a good indication of absolute function. If you keep the scales constant from one study to another, that makes it much easier to see real changes. And if you quantify the late images and add them to the extended renogram curves, that makes it easy to interpret those as well. So, if you have found this talk useful, you may be interested in some more of my renogram talks. I've already mentioned how to process a renogram, which is an accompanying talk to this one. Um, in that I explained where to draw the regions of interest, and how to achieve correct background subtraction, and how to quantify relative function and elimination. So that talk uh, really goes before the one that I've just given on how to display, and these two, two should be looked at together. If you're interested, I have another talk on models of the renogram, which shows several different models uh, explaining what the renogram curve looks like and how to interpret it. The renogram the rutland patlack plot explained gives more detail about the Rutland method of background subtraction, which I mentioned first in my talk on how to process a renogram. And the renogram deconvolution explained describes how to calculate mean transit time from the renogram, something that I also mentioned first in how to process a renogram. I also have another talk on diuresis renography, which gives an explanation of diuresis renography and compares with mean transit time by deconvolution. So, if you found this talk interesting, you may also be interested in some of these others. But thank you anyway for watching.